Welcome to Kinship Cafe. I'm your host, Jim Jones, and I am here with Mark Weaver. Hey, Jim. And our special guests today are Delaney and Company with Jared and Melissa. Yay. I'm Jared. He's Melissa. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So today we're going to talk about the new story. But before we do that, would you like to start us off with some music? Sure. Let's do this. Down by the river where all the ghosts live I can see her smile Long dark hair with a gray tint Deep brown eyes just like your kids So, so heavy from the weight of it Fragile heart from the cracks and slips She never meant for it to end like this These few words you should never forget Is that it's no simple road To get to She left here far too soon But she's never far from you Down by the river where a family lives they grew up mean they had to grow up quick the son of a drinker with a heavy stick a scared sister with the bruises that fit shoes worn down from the road they hit Broke their backs to make the best of it She never wanted you to live like this These few words you should never forget Is that it's no simple road To get to Left here far too soon, but she's never far from you. Down by the river, where all the ghosts live. I can see her smiling. Thank you so much, guys. That was awesome. Is that an original song? Yes, it is. And what was that called? Uh, we, we haven't fully ironed out a name for that one yet, but uh, maybe, Jan maybe Janice, because it was written about my grandmother and kind of my dad at the same time. So I don't know. It's up in the air still. Nice. Well, I definitely appreciate that. Love you guys' music. Thanks, man. So today we're going to talk a little bit about uh, kind of an overarching theme that's a part of what we're doing with Kinship Cafe. So this is going to be a good way to kind of kick off the new year with talking about what we are trying to accomplish with Kinship Cafe. And um, we're going to begin with kind of a basic premise, um, and then I'll we'll dive into some detail on it. So we're talking about the new story. And this will make a little bit more sense as we jump into this here. So our basic premise is that humans are storied people. And this will be the thing that I'll dive into after we get through our basic premise to explain what do we mean by that, that humans are storied. 
Second is that stories can change. Therefore, change is possible at a personal and social level. So let's jump into what do we mean by humans being storied people. Homo sapiens, which is our particular species, have been around for at least 100,000 years, uh, but we weren't the only human species around. There was maybe as many as six others uh, living at the same time uh, with us at one point. And humans go back maybe as far as two and a half million years. So there's a lot of history there, but there was something really unique that happened at 70,000 years ago, and that's been called the cognitive revolution. And what happened there is with our particular species of human, Homo sapiens, we discovered or evolved language. And the reason I say that we kind of evolved it, not simply discovered it, is because it's built into our brain. There's an evolutionary process of how our brains adapted to account for language. That's why you don't, in a certain sense, have to teach kids how to talk. They just acquire it as an instinct that happens. We're right? hardwired for language. We're hardwired for language. And, and this is across cultures. It doesn't matter what the language is. The basic process, the basic ways that language work is essentially the same. Noam Chomsky, really well known in some circles for his political stuff, his primary focus is on language studies, did a lot to really revolutionize this whole industry of understanding how language works. So. This was a huge change that became so advantageous to us that within the next 30,000 years, all other human species ceased to exist but us. Now, there's been various thoughts about why that may have been. Uh, one thought is that there may have been interbreeding that happened, and we just simply merged. The other is that we <coughs> took them out. Uh, and the thing that evidently made us so successful in that, whether for good or for bad, is this ability to have language. Another thing that happens then is communication was possible even before this, even amongst other kinds of species. Birds and monkeys and other things have been identified as having unique phrases that they will use to account for different things that scientists can record and play and it will cause other members of that species to respond. So there's ways of communicating, but they can only say things like, watch out, or there's a bird overhead, or something like that. They don't know how to communicate. Hey, on my way down here last week, I saw a whole herd of buffalo at the water hole. You know, um, or you know, just over the ridge, there's a whole other group of people, and they're planning something. We need to get ready for it. Or you know, come this time of year, it really is a good idea to go over the hill up to where the herds tend to spend most of their time now. Yes, right. So there's more information that can be communicated once we developed language. The other thing that becomes really interesting is that knowledge then can be passed on. We may see mother uh, chimpanzees being able to teach their children how to do certain tasks, how to wash something, maybe how to make something, but they can't really pass it on in the same way that we can. It's, Mo like, it's like a dog. Yeah. Like you can teach a dog to sit by saying sit, but you can't teach it to teach another dog how to sit. Exactly. <laughs> The dog learns everything that it learns, yeah. and maybe it's a lot. You can't pass it on. Exactly. Yeah. So this is another key thing that happens once that language uh, enters into the equation when we're thinking about humans. So one of the primary functions for language, believe it or not, is gossip. And this is because one of the things that we need to do as social creatures is kind of have a sense of where everybody is at. What are they doing? Who is trustworthy? Who isn't trustworthy? Who's, you know, maybe stabbing me in the back or who helped me out last time? All these kinds of interactions need to be kept track of and we need to remember those things and be able to communicate them to other people so other people know. And this is how that social solidarity starts to work. And this is really one of the huge things for humans as well 
you know, we don't have very big teeth. Our claws are nothing to write home about. We're not very fast. We're certainly not the strongest animals out there. The way we survive is through cooperation, right? So that social aspect is huge. One of the things that we can think about in that regard, too, is evolutionary-wise, we paid a price for what happened with our brains, how they expanded, in particular with the prefrontal cortex that allowed for more of our cognitive reasoning, how this language is coming about, is that our brains got really big compared to our bodies. If you compare the ratio of brain size to body size of any other kind of mammal out there, ours is way out of proportion. But what that means is we uh, have to be born premature. So at the same time that our heads were getting bigger, we were also learning how to walk upright, which meant that women's pelvises were getting more narrow, and so you get this bad combination of bigger heads and narrow birth passage, and so humans are born really premature. You look at other animals, a deer can be born, and it seems like in no time it's up walking around. Cats can be out foraging on their own within like a couple of weeks. Humans, it's years before little people are ready to be on their own. There's a lot of development that's continuing to happen even after we're born, which means we're completely helpless. If there wasn't community, if there wasn't this bond between mother and child, between families, we wouldn't survive. And so there's been this advantageous aspect of learning to respond and care about other people, and in particular, using things like gossip to keep track of what's going on in the community so everybody can be both on the same page and also keep other people in line. You can think about Facebook. Big surprise that this is such a <coughs> popular app. We are social people, and what is Facebook? It's all about social and a lot about gossip. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we love it and we hate it at the same time. We actually just watched a documentary last night on that Fry Festival. Oh. Or Fire. Fire Fry. Festival. <laughs> I was thinking the boots. Uh, <laughs> fire Spelt Festival. Similar. Yeah. <laughs> and that whole thing came to fruition because of Instagram, because of a public, a, a team of. Uh, it was like a marketing firm. Basically. Yeah, a marketing firm that, that basically just did brilliant marketing. Man. And. They couldn't pull off the festival <laughs> Enrolled time. the right influencers to be able to right. tell a story about how incredible this whole festival was going to be. And it was, by people's own admission, unbelievable. And yet they put their money in and showed up nonetheless. <laughs> to like which some brings up. FEMA tents and. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> Nothing else. They, it, showed, it was totally different oh, than what they horrible. expected. And this is another aspect of the evolution of our brain, that same sensitivity to stimulus, even the slightest sound while making our, our, our early way through the jungle, the sound of the saber-toothed tiger. And we survive today in part because of this metafunction of cognition and language like you just described, Jim. But we are also very sensitive to stimulation and stimulation that comes in the form of a story, which is about what you're about to talk about. And I wanted to put a bookmark in that. We'll talk more about that later, about how story is a part of our own evolution as a species. Absolutely. Yeah. What a great example that you just brought up, that documentary, which we just happened to watch last night as well. Wow. How's good? that for coincidence? It was right. so good. Wow. I was right. like, wow, this is a lot better than I thought it was going to be. I was totally into it. It's a great <laughs> documentary about, about a boondoggle on a music festival. You'd find it interesting. Yeah. I feel left <coughs> out. All right. So thinking about networking and communicating and gossiping within a network to keep tabs on everybody, it's crazy how fast it exponentially grows the number of different types of interpersonal connections. If you have just 50 people, you're dealing with 1,225 different one-on-one -on -one relationships. That's a lot, right? So what happens with this and why that's uh, important is we're going to see how that limitation of how many people you can kind of keep tabs on created kind of a a barrier to how large groups or communities could become. Uh, but just before we touch on that, I also want to demonstrate how much 
our brain is dedicated to this and how it functions for the importance of our social connectedness as a species. There's a process of the brain that functions when you're not doing anything. So if you're working on a math problem, if you're talking to somebody, if you're trying to figure something out, you're daydreaming, whatever, you're activating different regions of your brain that are working on stuff. But when you stop and you're not actually doing anything, there's another part of your brain that turns on whenever it gets a chance. Whenever you stop kind of doing something in particular, this, what they call default network, fires up. And this default network that's always running whenever it can, it is running through all those social connections. It's dealing with all those social actions and everything that has to do with how you know other people and really working to maximize how adept you become at being a social person. I mean, that's so important to your brain. It does it when you're not doing anything at all. I wonder that's why, if that's why people are so addicted to social media. Like when they're in their downtime, they're, they go, like usually that's the default that they go to. Well, you know and what I mean? Like when yeah. you're, if you're in a conversation, then you stop that conversation, mm -hmm. you walk away, they're like, Psh, click on that, see what's going on. And it's just something that, you know, being social is such a core part of our being. That's why Facebook yeah. is so addictive. It's a way to like be social even when you're not around other people, like in person. Yeah, you know, absolutely. Keeping, ta keeping tabs on everything. Yeah, it's staying in the loop. Speaking of evolution, <laughs> it, uh, it, it's a characteristic of frankly, the millennial generation, how much identity is discovered and reinforced online, as like re was referenced now, in the documentary. Right? Yeah. And so, Jim, in modern times, the, the multiplicity of connections, as you said, allows us to, to expose ourselves to a vast network of stories out there. Oh, yeah. And so you're you taking keep bringing up stories. Yeah, We're yeah, going to get there. Yeah. <laughs> we just have to understand why stories are so important to us and why they shape us the way they do. So in continuing thinking about how our brains are functioned and wired really for this social uh, necessity, the same parts of our brain that function when we experience physical pain are the same things that happen when we experience social pain. Believe it or not, Aspirin will help a broken heart. <laughs> no, that makes a lot of sense to me. Why a lot of people that are hurting turn to drugs, turn to addiction, turn to whatever they can to fill that void. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, it's, it's just showing that the reinforcement, right, that the social is as important to us as far as our brain is concerned is our physicalness, right? Our physical pain, our social pain, use the same process. Um, the same thing goes true also for rewards. Social rewards, things like fairness, get triggered using the same parts of the brain that happen when we have physical rewards, like pleasure. Uh, in fact, somebody coined the phrase at one point that fairness tastes like chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the key things we want to understand with this then is that the reward centers are activated when a group, or excuse me, when the group succeeds, even if it comes at a personal cost, which means that well-being of others is wired into us the same as self-interest. Self-interest alone is not sufficient to describe human nature. And, and we really want to at some point talk more about that because we have this idea that humans are basically selfish, that we're all in it for our own good, and the reality is we're actually really in it for other people too. Um, and, and, and this idea of, of how we act towards others isn't always just simply out of this idea of self-interest. There's this genuine thing where we actually <coughs> enjoy social connection, helping the group to succeed, even if sometimes it costs us to be able to do it. These are things that we want to acknowledge and understand about ourselves because these are important parts of how we function, part of our human nature. Okay, so... When we think about groups then being bound by gossip and the, and the cost that's incurred with that in terms of trying to keep tabs on everybody, the limit we run into is about 150 people. Once you hit that point, you really have to have a whole new way of how do we think about community, how do we think about group, because gossip can only go so far because you can only keep track of so many people. 
Enter fiction and the imagination. So this is a whole other aspect then that comes in with our cognitive revolution is this idea that we can think of things that don't exist. Now whether that's a future when we're thinking about planning or whether it's something completely imaginary, right? But um, how this gets then used is we are able to use myths which sometimes we think of myth as basically a false story. We want to think about this a little bit differently, but we can use myths as shared stories that within a community then allow us to have a connection with other people that allows us to have a trust relationship with strangers. Now let me give you some examples of what we're talking about with this. We're all familiar with the corporation. And sometimes we get upset at the fact that they have legal rights, right? That mm -hmm. they are considered, in a certain sense, kind of a person. Um, and that is an interesting thing, an aspect about them that we need to think about. Because if you have a corporation, if you took away all of its physical assets, all of its employees, the corporation still exists. It's not any of those things. It is something that doesn't exist physically. It's simply a figment <laughs> of our imagination, right? It's something that we collectively have agreed to believe in that's not real. It's kind of strange to think about it that way. But same thing is also true with money. What is money? Pieces of paper. But we have agreed to imagine that it means something, that it's worth something. Mm -hmm. Human rights that are so important to us. What's a human right? It's things that we have decided are important. Okay? So, were you wanting to say something? Uh, I think there's a name for it, right? It's called imagined order. Is that what you're thinking of? Is that, uh, have well, you heard that term? I haven't. That's an interesting no? one. <clears throat> yeah. I've, I'm reading a book right now, and a lot of this is like exactly what it's talking about. Well, and, and imagined order is one of the things that he talks about in it, where it's like basically this. It's like these myths and things that, you know, yeah. would bring people together, you know, even religion in, in a sense. Yes. Would be. Well, it's funny that you mentioned religion because when you first said the, you know, something happened at 70,000 and there's different myths of, as to why it happened. And my first thought was because I grew up in a religious environment well the great flood mm. that that's where my brain went with it but then i'm i'm at this point in my life too where i'm starting to look at things a lot differently where i've just kind of removed the little um microscope in front of me t and started looking at everything else in a bigger mm. picture mm. and considering other factors as well not just these stories that i was told that have shaped so much of my belief system because i was told to believe in them Right. Not so much discovered that on my own or, or agree, mm -hmm. even agreed with them. So. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting because the stories then, like we can see with corporations as an example, but really even states, right, or even people countries, in countries, everything. people in <laughs> positions of authority, you know, laws, all of it is essentially imaginary, right? But we collectively agree on it, and it allows us to cooperate at a much larger level than we could if we had to personally know each other. Mm -hmm. Because right. we can all agree <coughs> on this imaginary value of money and imaginary institutions like banks or education systems or laws about which side of the road to drive on and that kind of thing, we can walk into the store of a complete stranger and we can offer to buy something with this money and we can have this exchange and not have to know a thing about each other. But what we do know is your here participating in the same game, if you will, because you're using the same kind of money to p purchase this thing. And so that allows us to know, oh yeah, you're one of us. You're participating in the same way of ordering and structuring reality. Uh, therefore, I can expect you to behave in certain ways and you can expect me to behave in certain ways. And it ties in with like we talked about last time with culture, how culture is part of that 
process of getting to know each other. All the little habits or things that we do, the language we use, the accents, how we dress, these are all things that are social uh, cues to let us know who's, in a sense, part of our tribe, right? We've extended the idea of tribe beyond what it could be just through normal social interaction. So one of the key things then, well, and, and just before I get to the key thing, you were talking about religion, origin stories. One of the things and how they function and why they're so important within religious context is because they explain then this kind of map of the world, which is one of the terms I know, Mark, you like to use in thinking about how do we structure things and think about value and that kind of stuff. We have maps of the world. Mm -hmm. We've heard it, some of us in our Psych 101 classes as schemas. schemas. Uh, Claude Piaget was one that wrote about that, the, the notion that we actually create memories in the form of uh, a subject we're about to get to, stories, yes. interestingly enough. Yeah. Yes. Yes. That's, um, it's going to be hard to keep this one contained because there's so many fun <laughs> things involved here. So a key thing that we really want to remember then when we're talking about this idea of humans being storied, which is what we're talking about when we're talking about this myth and how we define the world and how we take the reality part and ascribe meaning and value to it is more of that mythic part. So we're living in two worlds. There's right. what we might call reality, this stuff, and there's the myth that explains why does this matter? Right. I'm thinking that it's helpful to identify some examples of this, that, that, that reality at one point was defined as indeed all other planets circling around the Earth. Mm. And that myth then was challenged, what well, you know it as the Copernican Revolution, and we know differently now. Yes, and this is one of the things, um, you talked about your transition with <coughs> some of your thinking uh, from some of your upbringing from a religious context. This is one of the unique challenges that's happening right now is our, our stories that we have used traditionally are starting to not hold up as well in light of the different things that we are beginning to know about reality. So mm. that's where a lot of the shift is coming. And really, now that we've kind of got this, this basic idea about how story impacts who we are as people and why it's important. Mm -hmm. And uh, really even at that evolutionary biological level of that need for that social connection and how we are just wired from the get-go, mm -hmm. uh, how these stories then and understanding that can come into play with thinking about our current situation. So going back to the basic premise, humans are storied people. Stories can change. Copernicus revolution you talked about. Therefore, change is possible. Mm -hmm. Right? There's a lot of things in our world right now that are very different than they used to be. So, And Jim, maybe we should review quickly one of our assumptions that we have spoke about earlier in this podcast series where we're looking at bringing the emerging... Uh, knowledge that is is available to us now and applying it to our pursuit of well-being <clears throat> well-being at the individual level family level tribal level our country the world and that assumption is that the greater the coherence there is between our stories and reality the better shot we have at well-being and the very important point that you made was that stories evolve the flips, the implications of that are, as you said, when our stories no longer serve us, then some sort of tension arises. And, and so uh, the, the concept of coherence is where we're going as we explore further this role of stories. Yes. Yeah. And when we're thinking about coherence, and the reason why at least I think that that's important, is that it allows us then to better navigate reality, right? So historically, I think part of what they talk about is wisdom. And I think wisdom is really this idea of, of, of traditions and stories that help us to map that 
connection between reality and our understanding of it, our myths that we hold, that the greater cohesion between those two, when that happens, is when we're talking about wisdom, uh, that whole idea that we can bring back into what we're talking about, too. So with that basic premise, then, what I'd like to do is, is do kind of an overview evaluation of kind of our current situation and how I think this knowledge about humans being stored can really help to give us some direction in thinking about the future. So again, our ability to cooperate as humans is made possible through shared stories that capture our imagination and our desires. So that part's really key because we do what we desire, which is kind of the next point here. So when we're thinking about new stories, if we're thinking about change, part of what we have to think about is being able to capture that imagination and build those desires for people to actually want to do them. Our traditional shared stories have been failing for two key reasons. One of them is uh, that they are kind of limited in their thinking in the sense that they create tribes that are pretty small. It creates an us versus them kind of an attitude. And in our world today, we are so connected and we're so globally connected that uh, we can't have that us and them. We realize that we're all in this together, that we're all connected, and what we do impacts other people and vice versa. So this is one of the challenges with some of our current configurations is that they create what has been called tribalism, people that are entrenched in their own side of things. And then we do have this emerging story that you've been talking about, Mark, this science that is undermining some of these truth claims, like the claim that the Earth is flat, the center of the universe, that there's a dome over it, and that the sun, moon, and stars are on the inside. Well, we know that's not true. Uh, and so that has had an impact on how we think about some of those traditional stories. And they've had to evolve. Mm -hmm. right? From there, the failing stories are creating a certain amount of anxiety because where we once felt like we understood what was going on and what life was about and what we're supposed to do, now we feel a little bit like we are free-floating, like there's not necessarily clear direction, and we've got to kind of figure it out, and that can leave us feeling a little bit anxious and not quite sure what we should be doing or why. Um, As a matter of fact, Jim, uh, interestingly, was just reading the other day, um, the American Psychological Association, who's been doing research on just measuring stress levels in the United States for decades, for the first time, uh, reported that the source of, of stress that overrides everything else right now in the United States for the first time is the stress over the political situation in our country. So it is that imagined mythical structure that we've created, which is our government, that is now being subjected to some forces of tension out there. And I think that's part of what you're, you're pointing towards here, this sense of well, general I, anxiety that we're having. I think the, the whole case for the millennials, you know, it's like, oh, look at them and their technology and everybody's saying they're selfish, but I think mm. that the majority of them just don't have an idea of what to do, right. how they could change it. Um, politically, they might believe in certain things. Socially, I think Pretty much everyone I talk to, we're 36, so everyone I talk to that's about our age and younger, they love the idea of socialism or like a democratic socialism. And, and de they loved Bernie Sanders, and there's a reason for that. There's, there's the stories are changing. People are starting to embrace um, LGBTQ. A, there's other ones. I don't know all of them, yeah. <laughs> but you know, uh, and, and and myself included, like two years ago. I was a surrogate for someone. When I first started the process, I was very, um, I, I was speaking with an agency that specifically dealt with homosexual uh, families. Mm -hmm. And it was founded by two uh, homosexual families and a former surrogate and I think a nurse or something like that. And 
I remember having a certain level of anxiety going forward with it because the religion aspect told me, mm. no, this is wrong. These people are in essentially like less than us, you know, mm. like that us versus them, which I've never agreed with. And um, I remember taking a step back and, uh, you know, I had the full support of my husband and everything, but I remember taking a step back and going, okay, now what do I believe about this? And because ultimately it's me going through it, it's my body, it's my decision. And um, I couldn't be grateful, more grateful f- that I made that decision, but right. it's funny how me doing that changed so many other people around me's perspective right. of homosexual relationships and all of that, and family and all of that. And yeah. I'm, I'm very proud of that. Mm-hmm. But I think the, with the millennial, these kids have no idea that uh, they watch the social media on Instagram and everybody's constantly feeding them a, a fake reality. Mm. Nobody's life is, you don't wake up that beautiful. <laughs> your, your butt's not that perfect, you know? I mean, the, that kind of thing. They're constantly like li- getting the right lighting and the angle and, and putting out on social media that their marriages are perfect and that their children are just beautiful or, or whatnot. And, and more and more people are missing reality. That's, that's kind of where I see it headed. This would be the place to come back to the bookmark earlier that I was referring to about another characteristic of this evolving brain of ours, and that is our, our literal addiction to stimulation, and combine that with the storied nature of how we understand ourselves, uh, are we important, are we somebody with something to offer in the world, and what you just uh, reminded us of is how powerful and overwhelmingly stimulating it is to get into social media and just scroll mindlessly in this zone of searching for an identity, as the research is showing on on much of the millennial uh, uh, population. So this storied nature is part of what makes us vulnerable in an increasingly digital information overload age. That's my point. And I think it's a generational aspects come into this too Mm -hmm. that make it really interesting to think about because Mm -hmm. there's digital natives like my kids and digital tourists like us. (laughs) (laughs) True, true. Right, and and our perspective of looking at what the kids are doing sometimes, I think we can uh, bring stuff to that that we need to evaluate. Like, why do we think that? Why do we think that this is causing problems or doing those kinds of things? I I was just uh, confronted again today as I was listening to an audio book on the way back about how Uh, the concern over social media creating an inability for people to actually care or be connected that we've all become kind of like this, you know, isolated and lonely, you know, kind of like the Bowling Alone book that we heard not too long ago. And he's like, totally does not hold up to actual statistical information and that people who are heavy social media users are still extremely compassionate and caring. Um, But there's different ways that it gets expressed. Right in different ways that it's, that it's working. So it's there's so many angles of this that I can't wait to dive into all the different directions that this can go because it's just fascinating. And I'd also line up right alongside those studies, the studies of the younger pre-adolescents who grow up addicted to digital screen stimulation and the limitations that's being demonstrated of their social lives later on when they're introduced so early. I'd put that right next to yeah. that slice of a population that can handle the balance of that very active social media life as well as being truly socially connected. Yeah, because that is another thing, too, that I've also seen previously that I wanted to circle back around to at some point is, because I know you deal with a lot about attention disorders, Mm -hmm. right, and and how that kind of regular stimulation is triggering different aspects of our brain that have to do with the pleasure center, the shifting lights, the rapidly moving Dopamine, the neurotransmitter. As opposed to more traditional things of like reading a book or something that engage the logic part of the brain where you have to decode the words, Mm -hmm. right, is creating potentially a context where we've got more of these attention deficit challenges. 
Right. Maybe. I don't know. Right. It's an interesting well, fields. I think it's worth pointing out, and I think, Melissa, we had a conversation about this at one time. It's not an accident that those who own these companies, uh, Apple, etc., their own kids, that they go to great measures to protect their own children from the very tools that their companies sell because right. of the, the knowledge of the impact. Uh, you told us, I think, a little bit about that, yeah, your observation that. one time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I deal with it with my kids. Even tonight, I'm like, they're sitting over there quiet. And I said, you all bring in a book. You know, so yeah. they're all, oh, I don't want to read. Can I just bring an <laughs> iPad? <laughs> nope. No, you can't. And, um, <laughs> and just insti- trying to instill in them a love for reading. Because yes. reading is, I mean, I, I sit there and tell them, if you, oh, you've seen the Harry Potter movies, but have you read the books? Well, no, why would I do that? I watched the movie because the books are so much better. Have you seen Lord of the Rings? Read the books. The books are so much better. Uh, you know, any any book, in right. my opinion, because you paint something in your head that just, it's never the same when you watch the movie. You're like, that's not what that guy looked like. Or they leave <laughs> characters out or, you know. Well, Jim, you mentioned the audio book. I guess that's a way to merge technology <laughs> with reading, right? <laughs> <laughs> I listen I, to them too, so I'm not... Mm-hmm. Yeah, like saying it's bad. No, it's it is like a way to sort of read, yeah. even when you're not sitting with a book in front of you reading, you're mm-hmm. still getting information. Well, and if you're somebody who has to carpool or yeah. not carpool but uh, uh, commute, commute. Yeah. Uh, it's a great way to redeem that time. Yeah, right. So. Okay, I'll, I'm going to circle back around to this political social stalemate mm-hmm. thing because I was thinking about it, and I'm like, you know, not much has really changed. You said people are still compassionate in all of this. It's just manifesting in different ways. And this political situation now in the United States specifically, I can't speak for other countries because I don't live there and I don't see or know much about their politics, but the ones that I see here, it really is, uh, oh, you stupid political party over here. No, you stupid political party over here. And people are saying things from behind their screens that they would never say to your face. Right. But then at the same time, it's still creating this us versus them. Well, I'm just going to unfriend you. I'm going to block you. I'm going to badmouth you. I'm going to bully you. I'm going to. And, and these things are all going on, but they're now going on in front of the whole world because now this technology has connected an entire right. world. Right. Well, and we have in our current situation a rather unique uh, president who's using social media yeah. in a way that I haven't ever seen before mm-hmm. uh, from a president. Um, and speaking about us versus them and political stalemates, at least at the time that we're recording this, we're dealing with a protracted government shutdown over you know trying to get something through. Um, and I, I didn't actually get to read the second half of this. We kind of stopped at the part of anxiety. But the other part then that's happening with this tribalism is we are becoming entrenched because as we feel that bottom falling out from underneath us, as the traditional stories are kind of going away, you know, we want to sometimes, some people are more comfortable with the freedom of, okay, now I'm free from that tradition and I can explore other things. Other people are scared to death and they think that this is the end of the world. And so they dig in their heels and they hold on for dear life. They draw the line in the sand and it becomes, you know, this entrenched uh, right. stalemate. Right. And a very emotional process. And that was the trigger to help me remember the earlier foundational piece that we put down is that when we find ourselves with these emerging elements in our culture and our society like technology, it's not all bad impacts on our youth, but we need to find that right balance. This, this sense that, that this, these myths of these former political parties, is there such thing as a conservative anymore? I don't know. This whole, this whole tension that's created for us, one of the ways in which we, we pursue well-being is we rely on a consensual method for defining reality. And part of that is the scientific method. And one of the great dangers of the digital media that we've been talking about is that information gets passed around as factual when in fact it's, it's woven into partial truths in such a way that the story is so attractive and confirms my beliefs that I already had, we already know about cognitive dissonance, that we're very vulnerable. And so I'm reminding us of that foundational piece when we talked about how it is we know what we know, Jim, the importance of that consensual process for defining reality, and that means instruments that we can measure with and have some sense of fairness in judging the data of what's reality. Yes, yes. 
And like our previous conversation, we are very limited in how we are able to perceive, right. both in terms of the hardware. Uh, we can only perceive to a certain level of precision, uh, and also in our glasses that we're wearing, which is going to be the worldviews that we hold, it's going to be the culture that we embrace, these myths that we're talking about really filter out what we can actually see or don't see. Right. Yeah. So this is kind of the core then of the, the situation is we're storied people. The traditional stories that have held us together are starting to fall apart for a couple of reasons, uh, multiple reasons, but two key ones. The fact that they're falling apart has kind of left us in this gray area of anxiety and tribalism. Um, when we think about this new emerging story that's coming up from within science that's challenging some of these traditional views, it includes everybody and everything. So when we think about the challenge of tribalism, how do we get past that? We have to be able to see everybody and everything as connected. And we need a way of understanding that connection that science helps to bring to that. Also, and because of that, it can, it has the potential to help end that stalemate because it gives us a potential way forward. But there are two key obstacles, as I see it, to this emerging story of science. One is that there is resistance to science from some traditional stories because of how it challenges them. And actually, the next time we get together, we're going to address this particular issue about the different challenges uh, from traditional sources to the acceptance of science and, and what we might be able to do about that. And the other is, there appears to be a lack of meaning or value with this new story. Because when we're thinking about evolution, when we're thinking about how things came to be, there isn't anything at the, at the reality level, the, the stuff that makes up matter and physics and chemistry, there isn't anything you can point to and say that this, this has meaning or value. Meaning and value come from the myth side of things. Right, And so if we are challenging some of those traditional myths with these new ideas, this new story that's coming up from within the realms of science, then it appears that we're left with meaninglessness. And along with that, this idea that there is no real value to anything, which is another one of the crises I think that we kind of deal with with that anxiety is when we start to see that the game is up with some of these stories, we might fall into a little bit of this existential crisis of, you know. I personally fall into the other category. I'm just kind of like, none of us know. We're all made up of matter, a bunch of atoms and protons, neutron nucleus floating around. Something happened that we got here. That's what science says. And none of us know. Well, So you can either yeah. get really anxious about it or just go, well, the one thing we know is that we're all born and we all die. All this other stuff happens in the middle, but we really don't know anything else other than yeah. that. Jim, I yes. want to just note that we just witnessed a worldview that is the lens and the filters that you experience the world through. And I'll bet if we go back, as you've shared in the past, some elements of your story of where that perspective comes from, it becomes, it becomes real clear that that you yeah. would have that perspective. And then there are those among us who are holding on, clenching on to stories that, that hold we, meaning for us that we can't let you, go of. You talked about uh, language, yeah. and we're musicians, and that in itself is a language. Yeah, it's absolutely. a universal language because you could hear a song, not know what the heck the singer is yeah. saying, or, or you know they're speaking in another language or whatever, and still connect with it. It yeah. can still mm -hmm. move you. It can, and then when you figure out what the words are down the line, you might be a little blown away it's because so you felt that anyway. Yeah. And I think music is one, I think is, if not one, the only thing that can do that. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting right. because music is literally a bunch of musicians telling their story through instrumentation and language. 
And one thing is people will connect. They'll, you know, lyrics are subjective most of the time. So they can go, oh, it's like this person is singing my life story. But it's not. It's their life story. But you connected with it because something that happened in their life is either happening in your life or right. is written in such it's a way relatable. that yeah. it's relatable to you. And it connects cultures, it connects people, it connects, it brings people together. And so I think part of the reason that my worldview is what it is, is because I'm a musician. Um, and, and growing up in the church, there's a pastor in Simi Valley who put out a series of um, DVDs, and he goes to different churches and he does these presentations. And I sat there and watched him at Hope Chapel in uh, Hermosa Beach probably 15 years ago. And the doc, the series is called The Rock and Roll Sorcerers of the New Age. Mm. And in his s- presentations, he sits there and presents numerous musicians, uh, Led Zeppelin, Michael Jackson, Prince, Madonna, pretty much anyone you could think of, literally, and Leonard Skinner, I mean, anyone you could think of. And you can go on YouTube and Google this. You'll find it. He does these massive presentations about how these people are... are uh, instruments of the devil and here's why mm-hmm. this is what their music saying and it's so funny because i remember him doing picking out a specific led zeppelin song and it's very convincing and then i hear them talking about it and they're like whoa it's about the lord of the rings or something I mean, it's just like some random it, it is about yeah no I, yeah <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, oh that's so funny or or you know they were recording stairway yeah. to heaven in that old house and then you watch uh I think it was Jimmy Page on Those It Might Get Loud right? talking Those about myths, his story. These things that like, and, but it's funny get because carried on like generations. Jim and I sat down one night generation. and you were there and I said, wasn't Satan the angel of music? And he said, why would you think that? Mm. Well, because this is what I was taught. And he's, he brought out hermeneutics and he brought out the Bible and he goes, well, here's what this says. And if you cross friends, that had nothing to do with Satan. Mm. And I'm like, wow, okay. So then I was totally perplexed, right? But these stories had been beaten into me, and then I had joined the worship team at my church, and I was told, don't sing with all your heart. You're taking away from God. You're, you're putting the focus on you. You're making worship about you. And I'm like, what? I'm getting up here, and I'm like not even here right now. Like wherever I just went, it was like transcendent. I'm doing my thing, and I feel good about it, and, and I don't know anything closer to God than what I'm feeling right now. Mm-hmm. I don't know anything Mm -hmm. and so it's it's interesting because my worldview music completely changed all of that for me over the years and it continues to do so and i think music is probably one of the only things that's inter-tribal like you could have multiple tribes like not like as an indigenous tribes but multiple societal tribes in one room at the same time enjoying the same thing well, just like that and Coachella, really Woodstock, Burning time, Man. You know? Nobody yeah. cared what politi- What are your political beliefs. I don't care. We're having a good time. We're naked. We're dancing. We're enjoying the music. Like, that's all they cared about. <laughs> yeah. So the power of worldview, Jim. Yeah. And, and I wanted to come back to this piece here about yes. resistance to science. We've got to be careful about our language here because resistance suggests an act of opposition. And, and what we need to be real clear about here is, uh, I would submit to you, even on this national stage right now, where people say some of the most, what, what I would label as outlandish things that are so far from reality, I can't believe they would say them. However, it is often the case that people believe 100% what they are saying because their worldview and the filters through which they are perceiving are so clouded, usually by the fear that is at the center of that, which is something we're going to be talking about more later when we get to our life practices, application of why does it make sense for us to be interested in stories in the first place? This actually has to do with becoming more aware of how our own brain works so that we can deal more productively with this stress level that we're experiencing in our country right now in the middle of this this government shutdown and, and lots of fearful stuff going on. This is a very practical skill to understand how we're wired and how important engaging other parts of the brain, the emotional activation and the patterning that goes with musical expression 
right. in itself that lets us access more of this capacity for thinking differently and not being locked into the, the orthodoxy that we were taught. But would you do have power to change your wiring, though? You, you, think you that do, yeah. absolutely. Okay. That, and that's that. what we're about <laughs> here. And it starts with getting some concepts down about this, this evolution that's going on in our understanding of, yeah. of how we are storied beings. And you left off with here about this piece about what we attribute meaning and value to, Jim. Yeah, meaning and important. just to kind of follow up on that briefly, you mentioned that you went through your current state of worldview where it's like, we don't know, you know, we're just a collection just of... It's like whatever happens, happens. Yeah, right? <laughs> so Lights go out. But for a lot of people, that doesn't work. And I can't tell you how many people, especially... It didn't work for me for a while either. I yeah. s and I still fight against I mean, even when you opened up with the... Something happened at 70,000, and I'm like, it was a great flood. And then I'm like, wait, but did that really happen? I mean, there's a lot of scientific evidence to suggest there's been floods in the... Big, big floods in the past, or at least one catastrophic one. But there's also other explanations for that as well. Yeah. Possible explanations. So, you know... I, I guess I just got to a point where I didn't want to. I didn't want to fight anymore with it. Sure, and, and, and there's logic, and then there's the other. What was the other one you called it? There's logical, and then the rational one. chaos. And you got to have them. You, you coherence. Yeah, like they have to be coherence for you to be between our stories and yeah, reality. Yeah, yes. thank you. Reality yes. and myth. Reality yeah. and myth. That's right. what you said. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, I guess for me, reality and myth are like one and the same at this point because I'm just mm. like. Well, there's still layers that we add on to it, right? And, and right. we all do, and that's okay. We, we kind of need to. But the, the thing that I've come across multiple times, especially from people who consider themselves more religious, if you confront them with more of this emergent story that's kind of like your worldview, they're like, well, why don't I just, you know, what's to stop me from going out and killing somebody then? <laughs> right? Because if there's no God, if there's no morality, I mean, they think that morality is, is oh. only possible because... Mm -hmm. There's, there's this good and evil. There's well, there's this God divine the source of authority, right? So this is why I'm saying the, the apparent lack of meaning and value in a more of a scientific story can leave people concerned about, well, does that leave us with, with nothing, right? And we're not going to answer that right now, but this is one of the things that's part of our agenda with what we're doing is exploring what does meaning and value look like if we're coming from more of a naturalistic perspective, which is what we're talking about, a more of a scientific worldview. Uh, how does that work? And I think there's ways that we can get there, but it takes a little time to develop, which is why we're doing this over multiple episodes. So um, the last part of this then is that the new emerging story has greater power to unite us because it's of its commitment to objectivity and continued re-evaluation. Uh, and the reason I say that is if you're a particular religious uh, tradition talking to somebody from another religious tradition, you can battle each other all day long, but at the end of the day, there's nothing objective you can point to that proves you know, right. that one God exists and another God doesn't because you're both using the same kind of arguments, you're both experiencing things, you're, you're having these thoughts. Um, there isn't an objective part of it. Whereas what we're talking about with the more of the emerging story that's coming out of science is it's based in objectivity so that there's a way to get to that consensus, that consensually validatable way of looking at what is real. And I think if you could get people to sell, se separate their myth from everyone's reality, because the reality is that we are all here. We're all living and breathing. We're all trying to feed our families. We're all trying to keep a roof over our heads. We're all trying to pursue goals or dreams. Or, and then whatever you believe aside from that, keep it to yourself. Well, this isn't to What's, say that people you know? can't have diversity of, of opinions and beliefs, right? Right. right. Uh, but when it comes to something about, let's say, public policy or how do we act socially, we need to be thinking about things th that we our can... Our earth, like preserving our earth. Well, yeah, like and how do we justify them? Or, or even people have different ideas about how to do that and how not to do it, you know. So I don't know. I. To me, everybody focuses on things that they don't agree on, 
when they're discussing things or whether they're arguing. And usually it starts as, as a discussion and then immediately you find something you don't agree on and then it turns into an argument and then you hate each other at the end of it, right? So what I never understood is why when people talk and discuss something, start with the things that you agree on. Mm. You know what I mean? Like that would seem to me the best way to do it. Yeah. Like, okay, like you and I have a different, you know, you and I have different religious beliefs maybe, right? I don't know. I don't know either. But <laughs> if we were to talk to each other about it, like let's just say one of us was Catholic and one of us was Christian, right? Instead of arguing about the small differences, why not talk about the larger picture of what is agreeable? Right. And you know, I've I, seen a lot of Christians get pretty outraged with Catholicism in the Catholic Church because they'll hold those annual, I don't even know what it's called, but the, the, at the Vatican they'll do the meeting and it has like a representative from each religion. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Not familiar. I, don't I know, know the majority of people. Like they have, they'll all at meet their... and have like, like, like a religious meeting. Mm. But there, uh, it's like a Buddhist, so, and, a, and it's oh. all the different representations. So. <laughs> and I think that's so cool. I'm like, uh, yeah. oh, look at them. They all don't believe the same thing, but they're sitting together having lunch. And talking that's about totally whatever. possible. Yeah. If you allow yourself to be open to it. If right. you don't allow yourself to be open to it, then it's not going to be possible. Exactly. I've, you try to have discussions about religion, politics, movies, anything. Right. If that other person is not open to another person's opinion, then you might as well just walk away from each other. But, how, you know, with all this, how do you get to a point where two different tribes can discuss something without ending up at war with each other? Well, here's the funny thing Jim, about this. Uh, if you don't mind. Uh, sure, Because please. I just feel compelled to tell this particular story. This is such a great point that you bring up, Jared. And, and it's this, this tendency of how we're wa wired for dualistic thinking. We have a particular difficulty in the cognitive science that's emerging right now shows what a difficult time we have holding to what we would say are different ideas in mind at the same time. We tend to gravitate to one or the other. And, and to, to bring this into the realm of why this conversation matters, I'm going to tell the story briefly about a man down in the San Diego area that about 35 years ago or so, I, 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 I may be wrong with that, the man's name is Azim Kamisa. Azim's son was uh, delivering pizza one night at, near the San Diego State campus down south, and he was shot and killed. And it turned out to be a gang initiation. Uh, situation where a young man ended up shooting Azim's son. What emerged from this was a relationship between Azim, the father of the victim, and the father of the perpetrator, who made history in the state of California for being one of the first juveniles to be convicted and, 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 and treated as an adult at such a young age. And that friendship turned into a lifelong commitment, the Azim Kamisa Foundation that recently has been recognized for having developed a process for addressing violence in schools. And part of the process that uh, I've seen applied as a result of this kind of transcendent way of what would seem to be two polar opposites coming together commonly to address the problem of violence in our youth and our culture is an exercise where you take factions from within a school, even gang members, and give them the assignment to produce, in this case, speaking of the arts, a brief video, five minutes long, that accurately portrays the world view of the other gang. And the other gang does the exact same thing for the so-called opposing game, a gang. And in that process, once the initial tensions are resolved, there is a seeking to tell a story and a conversation that goes on that takes that conversation out of the polar opposites and starts getting at what the literature is describing more as the third alternatives that need to be identified as solutions, whether it's in our political situation now in our countries, the gang violence situations, or any of a number of our environmental concerns right now. We've got to be able to have conversations yeah. to get away from that polar way of... Like, yeah, and like you say, right? at the core, majority of human beings are good, understanding, compassionate people, right? Mm -hmm. Like in 2015, there was that bus in Nigeria, you remember that story, where the, these extremists got on the bus, stopped right. the bus, got on it and said, you know, the Muslims need to get off and separate from the Christians, we're going to kill all the Christians, basically. And these Muslim women basically said, we're not leaving. 
Like, you can kill us all, but we're not leaving. Mm -hmm. So that just goes to show you that at the core, most humans are Mm -hmm. good people. And they're not, you know, when it comes down to life or death, it's like most of them are going to be there for each other, you know? It's a handful of bad apples, but, you know, as a... As a whole, majority are good, compassionate, understanding people. It's just finding a way to get through. You know, it's unfortunately sometimes it takes a situation like that to bring people together. It's a f- trying to find that bridge without an extreme situation. Yeah. Great example. Yeah. One of the things that, in the terms of the question, how do we get people on board? I, I don't know that that's really so much of a challenge because most of the world has already kind of moved that direction. In spite of what people claim to believe in terms of their differences, very few of us are living in a pre-modern worldview. We have very heartily adopted a lot of the scientific perspective on things. So um, I think that where we're at is kind of almost like fine-tuning the conversation. How do we get to the point where we can talk about it in a way that we can hear each other? Um, But I think that there's a lot of the process that has already happened. And in fact, there is a tremendous amount of really positive things that have been happening in our world that um, don't get reported. We focus a lot on the negative. And even in this presentation, I've been talking about the anxiety, but the anxiety is about kind of how we're perceiving things. The reality of what's going on is we've made tremendous progress in terms of the reduction of violence, hunger, almost any type of social problem you can think of. The amount of progress that we've made over the last couple hundred years is breathtaking. But because we only see our little sliver of our particular lifetime, we get focused on the negatives and we don't realize how much has changed. This will be one of the things we need to focus on too as we go through this. But um, So I think it's a little bit more of like how do we have the conversation? How do we get people to be aware of what's going on? Um, And and it might not be as hard as we think it is. Uh, It's just being able to actually do it. Yeah. So we talked about how the new story does allow for the differences to still exist or people to believe different things. It's not saying that somebody can't believe in God or a spiritual realm or whatnot. It's not saying that they need to either. Uh, But when it comes to issues about public policy, it needs to be things that we can justify. If we're going to infringe on other people's rights or limitations, then we need to be able to demonstrate why we're doing it. And it can't be because there's divine mandate it needs to be something we can kind of point at and touch and say this is why we need to do this Jim when you say the new story just checking in with you this means the stories that we embrace that uh, take into account our worldviews that evolve over time point we made about the quantum nature of, of reality and in our own nature and so that's part of what you're referring to as the new story Well, this emerging new story is what we are discovering through the various aspects of science, the different disciplines. The new story includes the notion that knowledge evolves over time and emerges, and that we must have a consensually validatable method that we rely on so that we don't be captive to old stories that no longer serve us. Is that what you mean by the new story? That's very much so, right? And and there's particulars that are important to know and understand, but those are things that we'll explore in more detail as we go along. But yes, definitely this idea that there's a consensually validatable way of looking at and understanding the world that answers the questions. And it doesn't preclude somebody from having, you know, different philosophical or spiritual beliefs. Um, It just doesn't necessitate them. Got it. Yeah. Um, So then our goals, which is really a lot of what we've been talking about, is how do we present and tell the new emerging story through our Experiencing Reality series, which is the one that we're currently engaged in. And then as you were want to bring up, well, oh, before that, also in that series, I want to look at how we can demonstrate the idea of meaning and value are possible within that emerging new story. And then uh, the other part of this is our life practices that you've brought up several times, Mark, that we want to have this not just an intellectual head game, but how do we put it into practice? How do we use this to deal with those challenges of stress and other things that are going on? 
So next week, we'll look at uh, challenges to science and how we might look at that a little bit differently within more of the traditional context and, and hopefully demonstrate that there's not as much conflict as there appears on the surface. Right. Yeah. The science, the, the next week's going to be interesting. Yeah. Just picking apart how science and those belief systems that we've put into our minds are challenged. I mean, like, I kept thinking of the whole San Onofre thing. We can all agree it's bad. It shouldn't be put in the bluffs of the, you know, right there by the ocean. shouldn't be burying all that toxic waste, but nobody wants to deal with it. Everyone wants to sweep it under the rug, but we can all agree that that needs to be taken care of. So just putting things like that at the forefront and finding a way to make it happen, come together and make it happen, Right. that would be a good example of it doesn't matter what money or myth or what reasoning, we all need to focus on the fact that this needs to be taken care of and just take care of it. Yeah. Yep. Well, would you guys like to close this out with a song? Sure. We'd love to, Jim. Well, thank you. Great.
Again, guys, fantastic job. I'm assuming that's another original song? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. And what is this one called? It's actually called Nigel's Song, and it's it's 100% relatable because there are 100% of people deal with death. Mm. But a lot of us recently have dealt with cancer specifically. And um, we had written this song a, a year prior to it, it popped up on a Facebook memory. We had played it, played it for the world, and completely forgot about it. And then <laughs> when it crept back up, uh, my girlfriend was actually losing her stepson to brain cancer. It was his second bout, and unfortunately it was terminal. There was nothing they could do. So he was on hospice, and when she told me that, I'd, I'd met the, the kid once, and he was a real sweet kid, you know. And... Um, something energy about him was special you know and he stuck with me but when she told me that it, he was terminal it hit me really hard I'm a mom you know and and I just I could not stop crying and for some reason I knew that that song was supposed to be for her for her husband for their loss and um, ironically I guess the lyrics were just so perfect to their situation so we ended up um dedicating it to him and calling it Nigel's song. His oh. name was Nigel. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, love having you guys here. Thank you so much for yeah. coming Thanks out. For Thank you guys. It was great. It was fun. Yeah. Yes, and looking forward to the fact that you guys will be back for the next one, so that's going to be fun to continue yes. the conversation. A couple more songs. Yes. We'll try to pick something more upbeat. Some more... Uh, <laughs> well, heavy what is discussions. It, what is yeah. it that you say? I don't make music. What, what's that... Uh, don't make music to make people move. Make music to move people. Yeah, there you go. Cool. <laughs> it's gonna be in a book someday so eventually. So cried. Like, that was what we remember were that guy. <laughs> nice. That weird long-haired guy that said that hippie, <laughs> that hippie stuff one time. <laughs> it's gonna be hard to pin down. There's a lot of you. Yeah, <laughs> true. My tribe. All right, guys. Thank you, and thank, thank you. you, studio audience, for being here today. Yeah. Thank you, my children, Thank for you. being so well behaved. So well behaved, audience members and children alike, yes. All right. And that's a wrap. <laughs>